Hey everybody, thank you for tuning in to the Life After GDPR podcast, where we discuss digital marketing in a post-GDPR world. In today's episode, I interview Robert Petkovic. Robert is a digital analyst from Croatia with a lot of experience um, and was a really great storyteller and has the ability to turn really technical topics into understandable language for non-technical people. Uh, for the last couple of years, he's, like all of us, probably been explaining to clients what the GDPR is and how it will impact their data. So it was really interesting to talk with him about how he approaches clients about these issues um, and how he handles these topics. Disclaimer before we dive in, I am not a lawyer. Robert is not a lawyer. We are also both not data privacy experts. So nothing we say in this podcast should be taken as legal advice and you should hire a proper lawyer or a data protection officer. With that out of the way, hopefully you can get something of value out of this podcast and enjoy. Um, so here's my episode with Robert Petkovic. Robert, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, Rick. Yeah, it's, it's, it's an honor. It's an honor to be in such a great company, yeah? <laughs> I'm going to start off with uh, introducing you with uh, something that maybe people don't know about you, and that is that you're actually secretly a rock star. Secretly. <laughs> Just secretly. You have had a number one hit notation in Croatia. Let's start with that. Before we dive into analytics, let's start with that. Yeah, we, we had, it was, I think, 1995 or 1996. We really had a, a, a huge hit. Actually, kids nowadays are again listening to the same hit and the, to the same rock star so yeah it, it was great it was fun times and what i usually say uh that happened in 1995 when we prepared the second album and in 1993 i think i i noticed the first uh the first piece of text about html or about the links and web pages and it hit me so hard i immediately went to notepad and started creating some interesting stuff and for that second album of a band, uh, we created, my wife and I, we created a, a website dedicated to the band with introduction to every band member, uh, dedicated to both albums with, uh, uh, with lyrics of all the songs and presented the second album. So we were officially the first band in Croatia who had a URL on a CD cover. So something to, to, to record. I that couldn't so get cool. a CD. It's over there somewhere in the stock. Oh, my cities, but okay. I, th I think we're going to put it in the show notes. Okay. <laughs> I don't think there's just way back machine that has that uh, URL. It's so, so old. We should find it, right? Yeah. Okay. But that's really cool. Um, so um, you, you, had a, you had a brief career as a, as a, as a rock star, but in, eventually you still uh, ended up in the technology side of things and in the web analytics side of things. Well, yeah, I went to technology high school and then I studied psychology and then I mixed it all together. And uh, I think that uh, the te technical part helped me understand the tech stuff. The psychology helped me understand the uh, human behavior. It helped me understand the statistics and analytics a lot. Because I don't know, many people probably don't know that, uh, but uh, psychology has the most advanced statistics in social sciences, definitely. Uh, because, I don't know, if you, if you don't interpret somebody's personality test well enough, you can screw up his career, his life. So it's, yeah. Pretty, pretty tough. And uh, uh, the third part, the rock star part, and I also used to be an amateur actor, that helped me uh, with my stage presence. So that's why I'm usually uh, going around conferences, uh, presenting things about uh, web analytics. And I'm trying to explain ordinary people uh, how to understand analytics better. That's something I do. I like to translate all the, all, all the things that more intelligent and more advanced people than I am are talking about. I'm trying to translate that into, let's say, human readable uh, language or something that uh, clients who are not fond of statistics or figures and charts and numbers are actually, uh, they, they need to understand that in order to uh, run their businesses better. That's why we are here about. Well, once I learned this about you and, and now also the actor part, uh, um... It makes a lot of sense to me because I, 
I I already saw that your yeah your presentations you're really good at storytelling. Basically, you you understand how to take a complex topic, turn it into a story in order to to get other people to to understand why it's important and 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 highlight the important parts of it. And I think I think you have this also. Uh, previous podcast guest uh, Steen also has this Steen, very much. Steen, we had to mention yeah. Steen. I had <laughs> good teachers. I had good, great teachers. Some of them were in my uh, college. Uh, um, the frontman of our rock band, who is still a star in Croatia, was a great teacher for me. And I was in, in the back, a uh, backup singer and, and a drummer. I was. Uh, master of the ceremony, but he was the, the leading. He taught me how to uh, play with the audience. But there were sto great storytellers like uh, Miroslav Varga from Croatia, uh, Jim Stern, definitely, Ali Meshkaushik, and especially the, the Steen Rasmussen. I like him very much. Uh, I admire his storytelling. And just today I wrote a tweet saying how much I hate Steen sometimes because uh, uh, he usually speaks before me at some conferences or he usually speaks at conferences and I'm not. But he sees some, uh, uh, some data set or he sees some uh, situation from uh, ordinary life and he translates it into uh, a story which helps our, us analysts understand data much, much better. And he does it in a great way better than me, but I'm struggling. I'm trying to do my best. And uh, I think Steen also has, uh, would put some nice words about my storytelling as well. But yeah, it's, it's stories what helps people understand what the data is all about. Because you had a great uh, uh, specialist on your, on your podcast, people who are much, much better than I am and, and, and a great specialist in their own fields. But they usually talk about specialties that ordinary people don't relate to. And yes, us who understand, I don't know, server-side tag, ma Google Tag Manager or, or uh, I don't know, tags or data layer, we understand what it's all about. But the ordinary people don't relate to those terms and they cannot... Uh, use those conclusions in their own uh, worlds. So that's where I or Steen or our, us storytellers are coming along. We are trying to find out some interesting bits from everyday life, correlate them with all those technical parts and tell a story to people about uh, something they can relate to. Uh, I suppose we will, we will talk right now about the, the, the Sephora or uh, the black and, and the red shopping basket. We, we, we were to talking about that uh, earlier and, and you just sent me today a link on LinkedIn where uh, Flannel's Beauty, it, it's some uh, beauty cosmetics store in UK, I think so. They have, they have uh, uh, bla uh, black and white uh, shopping basket in front of uh, their store saying, if you take, I think it's if you take white, then uh, yes, I need help. And if I take the uh, black one, then it says, okay, I don't need any help. Don't, don't help me. Or if I'm into it, I'll probably take a black one and saying, please don't approach me. And that's for me, that's a perfect example of a GDPR or a cookie panel. That's how I actually explain uh, marketeers what the cookie panel is, how we are polite to our customers. We are asking them if they need any help further or if they just want to be left alone while browsing our website. So the same principle offline online. So yeah, finding such, such stories from everyday life and, and trans translate them into data sets uh, and I don't know, bounce rates or conversion rates or something it is, is something we should, we should do more often. Um, and this analogy that you just shared, I think it's, it's really powerful. Um, so just a little bit of background, you, you help, you help customers with digital analytics in the broadest sense of the world, but you, you, you help with tagging, but also with analysis and with the whole spectrum, right? I work for a uh, pro media group. It's a media agency, one of the biggest media agencies in Croatia. We also have a digital division and a consulting department. And uh, the media part is great with TV ads and billboards and so on. But we also have a digital part. And there are a lot of clients there who actually still don't understand the digital part quite well. So I'm trying to, I don't know, 
use Google Tag Manager to implement Web Analytics the proper way for them. Right now, I have a huge project for uh, uh, a large comp- corporation in the region of uh, GDPR audit and uh, implement proper analytical implementation aligned with GDPR for all their websites. So yeah, I'm kind of helping people implement the web analytics in a good way, but I'm also trying to explain them later what all those figures and charts mean and how can they use that, those uh, fig- KPIs, tables, charts, and everything in order to make their businesses better. And the most interesting part for me is actually to uh, work with clients in order to define KPIs. So what is a proper KPI for you? That's something that Tim Wilson actually uh, taught me a lot. Uh, uh, I'm... I'm asking a client, what's your KPI? What do you think your KPI should be? How can we achieve that? Do you think you have uh, enough uh, uh, crew at your company to, I don't know, produce so many newsletters? Do you think you have a budget for achieving that KPI and so on? So, yeah. And I loved working with uh, uh, web stores, e-commerce web shops, because enhanced e-commerce in, in Google Analytics uh, especially gives a lot of, lot of data that can help each member of uh, e-commerce store the crew to to understand the human behavior the customer's behavior better i even help them understand the offline behavior better and the most interesting thing for me is that was that i found some metrics in google analytics enhanced, enhanced e-commerce that help that help stores decide which products they should put into offline windows and which products they should put uh, when you enter the store and here they are. Because one type of product is why they will stop in front of the store and the other product is why they will go inside and buy. The good example is, I don't know, iPhone 14. You just need to put it in the store window and people will go inside and buy iPhone 12. Yeah, and that's it. So yeah, I'm trying to to understand the data and implement the data. Yeah, okay, most of my projects end up with just uh, Google Tag Manager implementation and the, the data flow and data storage. But yeah, I do have also a lot of the implementations where I consult people. And I do have my own company for lectures. So I do a lot of lectures and uh, appearances of conferences uh, and talking about web analytics. They say I'm decent or good so yeah here we are i hope somebody recommended me uh seeing me on some conference so yeah that's fine and also for the last five years i'm talking about gdpr a lot in web analytics yeah yeah because because that is invariably if you have been helping companies gathering all this data especially via the google stack then increasingly you will get questions from your clients about hey is google not becoming illegal right they are getting scared or they are getting a notice and then you know this uh, this topic since 2018 uh has been on our radar at least a little bit before that hopefully yeah i, I remember orderly paul she was scaring us i uh, even in 2016 no problem we are yeah she, scared. she was she was early early in scaring us but she was good she is good she's good in that yeah so you have also been involved in these talks with with various clients of various types of businesses that collect data online and trying to explain GDPR to them. Let's let's walk through that process. So what what is it what is it currently that you see your clients asking? Like what are they what what is their mindset when they start the conversation with you? Can you fix me that GDPR in like half an hour I'll pay you. Or if you think it needs to be paid well, I'll pay you. So the first thing is, can you fix me that GDPR in like five minutes? No, I can't. And most customers think that it's just half an hour job. It's like uh, implementing the web analytics. What do you mean? You just take that one piece of code, put it on a website, and that's it. We don't need anything more. Yeah. And then I'm trying to explain that. That's why I go to conferences and even trying to scare people sometimes with stories on how they need to understand what the GDPR is. And uh, okay, when we start the process, I'm usually uh, have, I usually have a meeting with some data protection officer. Uh, if that's big company, then that's usually some I don't know uh, old policeman or security guard from the old system who is good 
good in everything. And he, he's, he's trying to scare me because I'm trying to steal the data and whatever. So Google is bad guy here and you are not good and you need to shut everything off and then we'll talk. So I'm trying to, to, uh, I don't know, help them also understand, uh, what happens with the data. How are we, uh, saving that data is there any personal identifying information which is also the thing to consider what personal identifying information is what's uh identifiable data and uh i don't know if things get rough if i'm really a bad guy for them i simply ask them uh did you check your web logs uh, web server logs data are you okay with that with that okay and i usually put that we can check that. Where's that? Where's our servers and so on? So, yeah, I do have some techniques to I mean, scare them. But no, it, it's not about scaring each other. It, it's about understanding uh, the core complex of uh, GDPR of data or data protection in some organization because every organization is different. You know, uh, I, I usually, I even say in my uh, um, lectures, then uh, if I'm implementing uh, e commerce analytics on some website, I don't need to be a data protection officer. I cannot be a data protection officer. And I can have one kind of relationship with that company, like data processor, or I, I don't know what to, to, to name it. And I'm good. And if you are a website owner, and if you ask me, can you please check the transaction number AB12345? There's something wrong with it. Yeah, I can. It's totally fine. I will check it out and I'll say, okay, probably this is fake or whatever. But if you tell me, hi, my friend Peter just bought something and his transaction is AB12345. Can you check? No, that's data breach. And people usually don't understand that that is also data breach. It happened to me a lot. It happens a lot. And I usually educate people then by saying, no, you cannot ask me that. No matter it's just the two of us in this phone call, but you cannot ask me that because that's you revealing the personal identified information. Also, if I do have a, a approach to their CRM with uh, um, with people data, and if I if I do have approach to Google Analytics, that's totally different level. We need to uh, write totally different agreements than if I'm just uh, implementing GTM and sending data to Google Analytics and so on. So. Even the internal organization means a lot in implementing GDPR. So I'm just I'm just trying through all these talks and even with this to talk today, I'm just trying to help people understand that this is not such an easy job and that they also need to implement something on their side and they need to figure out whether to go left or right on some uh, crossings in order to implement GDPR the proper way or to be aligned with the GDPR. Are we completely aligned? I don't know. Often when they ask me, can you align this analytics with GDPR? Totally no. 100% no. Because I think any good lawyer can, I don't know, sue us all for anything they find in there. And I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know legal stuff that much. But yeah, we cannot be totally aligned. But yeah, I, I, I do know that uh, when Mark Schrems and his crew, his gang, when they started suing uh, 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 websites around the Europe, they actually, uh, most of the websites didn't get fined. Most of them said, really? We didn't know we are doing that. Or, okay, yeah, we were doing, but we will, we will stop it. Is that okay? Yeah, that's okay. M most of those who were just rigid or uh, or not humble, they said, okay, what's the fine, we'll pay it, so no problem. So it, there were some lousy implementation of Google Analytics throughout the Europe. There are many, many, many lousy implementations of Google Analytics throughout the Europe saying, just put those lines of codes on the website and we are okay. This is not a good way to implement a website. So if, if we manage just to raise awareness of website owners so that they can be more polite to customers, and uh, uh, decide what to do with the data and we can help them. I don't know, we will make this world a better place. <laughs> what, they, what they say usually. Yeah. From, from the client's perspective, there's usually a couple of people that have grown accustomed to this data. 
right? So there's a uh, there's the email marketer and there's the social media marketer and the paid search marketer and then you know depending on how big the company, these will be separate functions or one or one person and uh, and the marketing manager, of course, they have their KPIs and their dashboard. Um, and let's assume that maybe they had a cookie compliance wall, but the but it wasn't integrated, right? So it was just there for show, as we as we know that is often the case. So now you have to tell them that their boss said they have to become GDPR compliant. So at least you're going to integrate the the cookie banner with the actual what happens in Tag Manager, right? At least, yeah, yeah. How are you handling this conversation with the, with the client? What are you uh, what are you telling them? Oh, a lot of stuff happens. Some of them are angry, angry at me. What do you mean right now we need to, I don't know, erase the, the whole e-marketing uh, database and so on? But uh, the, the, the real situation for me starts when I analyze the client. And I try, I'm trying to figure out whether they raised from the sales department or from the marketing department. Because the sales, they usually want to pre approach the individual. They need individual email addresses. They need to find that individual person, which marketing usually don't. We operate in groups of 100 or more people. So it's not that marketeers want to target a specific person. And marketing is here to educate people about the product, to, I don't know, make them our friends and our ambassadors. So we educate both our uh, uh, customers and both our employers in order uh, to be compliant with the brand. Sales is just, okay, give, give me figures and numbers. And if you can just give me that person in the store, I'll take care of the rest. Just bring me that person and I'll take, and they'll do it the great way. So that, I'm trying to figure out, okay, which part of this process they are from the start, they are the marketing or sales. And then I'm trying to, uh, to I don't know, create my strategy on how to deal with, uh, with that. And I usually say, okay, we don't need to erase all the database. How did you get that database? Was it compliant? Did they, um, did they um, leave you their email addresses on your website for getting discount and for further uh, <clears throat> promotions? Or you just bought a CD from some strange Russian guy with 1 million web addresses? What did you do in that case? And so on. And um, for remarketing, it's, it's especially hard right, right now in remarketing because you are not allowed to put people in remarketing Facebook pixels or whatever if they didn't allow you uh, marketing cookies. So yeah, uh, if you didn't do that, then we're in trouble. So that's when they are starting to be uh, nervous. Okay, well, they, they ask, okay, what about... Uh, our remarketing lists, whether it be uh, if there will be 20% of the current um, volume, then we will not be able to do anything with them, and so on. But the the good thing is that I usually ask them my my statistics from various websites, where I'm showing the um, the ratio of acceptance of uh, analytical and marketing cookies or declining all the cookies, and. Uh, I did have an interview a couple of years ago when I said uh, that GDPR is one of the best things that, that actually happened to marketing because it helps us learn to that we need to behave to our customers much better. If they want the content, if, if they think that's the good quality can, content, they will accept everything, no problem. I do have a small percentage of, uh, of dropouts for marketing cookies, really. If they're, if they're accepting, they're usually accepting all marketing, both marketing and analytical cookies. So there's like 2% difference among that. But the main difference is uh, uh, what type of website that is and what type of uh, advertising there was. So if, there, if it's some corporate website, 70% of people will accept all. If that's some uh, big website with huge, I don't know, display marketing or Facebook marketing, there'll be like 70% of uh, GDPR cookie panel dropouts, which shows that most of, I don't know, uh, programmatic and display uh, traffic is 
maybe even fake, but I'm not, I didn't say that. That's a different yeah. podcast. <laughs> that's, that's a different podcast. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it, it, it shows how, how quality our uh, ads are and are those ads actually telling the story that has a good beginning and ends on our website. So if people are not feeling that that story ends well on the website, they will drop out. So I actually don't have a problem with that. Yes, remarketing lists are uh, smaller, are getting smaller, but th that's much better. Uh, it's much better quality in those remarketing lists. So yeah, it's actually people who want to be uh, um, who want to be targeted back. Previously, we thought everybody wants to be retargeted because that's what we think as marketers. That's what everything, uh, that's what people usually want. But it's it's not the way. When you need to, you need to find a different way to tell the story to for people to understand what actually that remarketing means or sharing the data uh, means. Uh, I remember uh, uh, sharing a few words with Jim Stern from California the other day about GDPR Europe, and he was asking, okay, what are we talking about? Or how is the situation right now in Europe? And he said that when his daughter was pregnant, uh, when she declared she was pregnant, some two or three weeks later, she started having some um, newsletters in, their, in her mailbox, in a physical one, not, not virtual, in mailbox uh, regarding some uh, supplements for, uh, I don't know, for her teeth or for uh, food. And, and she said, yeah, maybe that was my pharmacist. Maybe that was my doctor, but I don't care. I, I have a good quality content in my mailbox and I'm good with that. So Americans are like more, yeah, we are getting good content out of that. Europeans are not because we had a, a few situations in the history where people actually uh, end up dead with the various data breaches. I don't know whether Aurelie Pauls told the story about uh, Netherlands. You had a census in 1930s or 1920s. No, she didn't tell it. Okay. Uh, she told me that story and um, there was a hunger in the, in the Netherlands. I couldn't find a, a link. I asked her about the link. I couldn't find a link about that, but it's, that's a story. And there was a hunger and there were a lot of homeless people on the streets of Netherlands. And uh, you had a census there, and uh, the nationality and religion was the thing asked there because the government wanted to bury uh, the homeless person in according to their religion. So it was a good cause. And then the Nazis came and got the database and said, gee, thanks. Yeah, it's a nice list so, for us. <laughs> so it's not yeah, that, yeah. that good. And I know that Jim also said, Jim Stern also said to me, uh, uh, that he asked the, uh, his friends, uh, do you want, okay, we have data breaches and so on, and there's a lot of data going on uh, around private companies and public companies. Do you want your data to be available for Obama administration? No problem. We don't care. A couple of years later, he asked, do you want the data to be available to Donald Trump administration? Well, yeah. And now they have a situation where uh, there are a lot of women around the world who are having the, the health applications, uh, putting the, the menstrual cycle data in their mobile phones. And it all goes to US, to private companies who can sell that, sell that data to some countries where the abortion is legal. It's not legal. So yeah, that's a tricky. Even states in the United States. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think, um, I think Hannes, uh, Hannes Kuhl in uh, a couple podcast episodes ago, he said it very well he said like person sharing personal data or privacy is about you are opening and closing doors for your future selves but you just don't know which doors you are opening and closing yeah that, that was a good state and yeah. and you're sharing the data and today it seems harmless to share this data right so let's in the dutch example right the, so it was for a good a good cause to get buried in your own religion's uh it's always for a good cause yeah it was for a good cause but then uh, 15 years later uh, somebody else uh, gets that data and, and and closes a door for you that you uh, that you didn't want closed so yeah that's a any technical any technical product comes up with a good with a good cause Developers are usually pretty cool, pretty good, good guys who won't just make the world a better place. But it ends up in other marketing and sales.
I think I think one point you made earlier about I don't recall it exactly anymore, but about marketers, um, th yeah, that we that we have to do our best now. I think it's also what was the case is that before GDPR or rather before all the the scandals that came out like Cambridge Analytica and all these kind of things, right? When it got popularized by uh, popularized by media like Netflix uh, documentaries and stuff. Before that, I think a lot of the marketeers themselves did not actually know that this one extra JavaScript that they asked to put on the website could have so much impact down the line, right? Could open or close the door somewhere down the line. There was a mismatch between the people who required to implement the technology, the marketers, right? Because they, they, the marketers in most cases just wanted a better user experience. So they wanted to improve advertising return on investment, which means they want to show less irrelevant ads to people who are not interested, which is in essence a good thing, right? Because nobody, if, if I am not a woman, I don't need to see advertisement for women's products on, on my device. Or if I don't have a, a kid, I don't need to see advertisement for buying diapers, right? So that in essence makes the web better. So the the first thought of that was like, they save money on advertising and it makes it a better place for the people who browse it. Mm -hmm. um, but they because they did not understand the technology of what they asked to get implemented, it was kind of a Trojan horse where it was so easy to implement all this JavaScript because all the vendors made it so easy. But then all the vendors realized like, hey, what, what else can we do with all this data? And then it got a little bit, little bit out of hand and now we are where we are right now. Yeah, and, and, and the quality of uh, digital marketing around the world is getting worse day by day. Because uh, all you need is, I don't know, finish one course and claim yourself a senior uh, advertising and you'll get some client and you'll get some results. So every day there are tons of kids with less knowledge than some others who are entering the market and he, who simply don't know what damage they are causing or wrong. And yeah, the whole market was uneducated uh, a couple of years ago regarding what can be done, what's legal or not, or I should say what's polite or not. I know in Croatia we had uh, a law, pretty good law regarding personal data information and it's like we didn't need the GDPR, but nobody paid attention to that. The fine was so small that nobody paid attention to that. So GDPR was great because the, the fine was huge. It was like... Two billion, and everybody turned around. Oh, we need to pay attention to that right now. So that's that's a good thing about GDPR. It it, it made the privacy or decision that people want regarding their privacy uh, put in focus. And what I usually trying to uh, explain marketers regarding that it, that it is not such a bad idea because we we are polite, or at least salespeople are polite to customers in the real world. The example of shopping baskets, shopping carts is uh, really good. Uh, the other thing is we do have remarketing uh, and retargeting in offline sales because if you come to your familiar store, the, the salesperson will uh, ask you, oh, good day, Mr. Petkovic, how are you today? How did your wife's jacket was nice? Uh, is she okay with that? And so on. So if it is kind of remarketing, we want. And also anytime some person enters the store after a couple of steps, the way that person behaves, looks around, the salesperson knows exactly, uh, is, it, is that person here to buy something for themselves or for the others? Uh, does that person know where she is or should it should be some different store? Uh, is, is that person on a mission? You know, when, when I don't know, when... Um, when a guy approaches the, the drugstore, he's probably on a mission. He needs to pay, buy diapers or some family product. He's on a mission. He needs to, to, to get the appropriate product uh, right there. So the, the, the salesperson know exact words and the exact way to approach that, uh, that person who enters the store. In digital marketing, what are we saying that person? Buy, buy here, come, buy here. Just giving the same, well, the, the same lousy uh, advertising to all the people because everybody's our audience and lets everybody come to our store, which is actually not a good idea. So yeah, we need to be more polite about that. And the other thing, even if we know the customer well, 
there are situations when that customer doesn't want to be recognized. Uh, for example, if I want to buy a new jacket for my wife on a web shop that we usually use, I will go into incognito mode. I don't want her to see the ad about that surprise. So yeah, I will switch to incognito mode or say in that session, no, I don't want marketing cookies because it will ruin the surprise. There is a scene in, 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 a, in a movie, Love Actually, you remember that, uh, Love Actually, when uh, uh, it was Rick, uh, where, where Mr. Bean uh, was a salesman and he saw he sold that necklace for, uh, what is it, Alan Rickman was the actor. He, saw, he sold the necklace for Alan Rickman and he spends, I don't know, five minutes uh, preparing good, a, a good package and everything else. And then his, uh, his wife came along and uh, she actually ruined the surprise for it was for, for his mistress, but never mind. We didn't know that at the time. But his wife came along and she was like, no, no, we are just, I'm just browsing, browsing, just moving around, and they left. That's also the situation where we don't want to be recognized or we don't want everybody else to know what we are doing right now. But also there are situations where people don't want to be recognized, but maybe they need to. Uh, I think we also mentioned the situation, I don't know, or, or on, on a street square. When you are, I don't know, waiting for a street car to arrive. Yeah, you can have your shades ahead, so not to be recognized by the uh, surveillance camera. Yeah, okay. But you still are a person on the square. If And if a mayor wants to know how many people are on the square day by day, you need to be counted in, into that uh, calculation. You cannot be opt out that. So I think that a legitimate interest, which European law says that it's not a legitimate interest, but legitimate interest for market is to know how many sessions there were or how many page views there were on some website or how many transactions was on the website is something that should be uh, in, that, uh, in the Google Analytics data. Actually, Google Analytics 4 says there's going to be interpolated data, data in that case. But yeah, that's something we need to know. Not how many people that's different. That's you need to exchange some personal interaction with not the specific people, or not even how many people. But you also in a, in a, in a big store, uh, uh, if you enter some store, there are counters on on, on doors, and usually at the end of the day they said, okay, we had twelve thousand people coming. No, you didn't have twelve thousand people. You had twelve thousand entrances to your store. That of the sessions, let's say, into your store. You don't know how many people were there unless you are uh, uh, not in line with the GDPR. So we do have something in the real world, something else in, in digital world. Uh, and, but uh, with, with such examples from the real world and digital world, I'm trying to explain to people where we are and how can we make things better yeah. for all. So let's assume that um, currently what we are seeing is that most of what we know as as marketing analytics right now so let's take google analytics just as an example but most tools do the same thing they collect personal data what the gdpr calls personal data and even even the cookie id so you know just a unique id even though it is not tied to any other thing of my name it is still classified as personal data under the gdpr let's let's just assume that that will stay that way right and not not go into that discussion so okay every every digital analytics tool that that has the ability to identify unique users is non it, well will require explicit consent at least uh, and then currently hopefully uh, currently probably it should also be hosted in the in Europe and not in the in the United States right but that's a different discussion for now but let's assume that if we take it one step back, do you think it would be maybe be more valuable to companies to switch to aggregate analytics and drop the users, so to say? So drop the unique way to identify users and, and actually take a little bit of a step back, but that way create an analytics that is not that is not personal data, technically speaking? Oh, it's also a good question. I don't know because all the data in Google Analytics so far, or most of the data in Google Analytics so far, is actually aggregated data. 
And if you are doing marketing and analysis, you are always dealing with aggregated data. The way that data was aggregated is something that maybe is not aligned with the GDPR because you need a lot of identifiers, although it's not a personal thing. You need a lot of identifiers to find out that it's the same person who visited the other day and so on. Yeah, we know that. I'm not quite sure because we opened the uh, user level data to marketers a couple of years ago. We said, here you have users finally. You have unique users, which is concept I hate. You have either users or who visit them, that's it. But yeah, you have unique users. You know how many people actually are out. And uh, the problem is with, with many marketers, they only understand the concept of people. If you, are, if you are telling them about the number of clicks on Facebook, a pixel and the number of sessions in Google Analytics, they all think it's people and those figures don't match and there's something wrong. So yeah, the concept of people is something that marketing understands better, much better than any other metric we have. And that's the fact. We need to be aware of that fact. Right now, we have a, a, a law that says we are not allowed to provide you with such kind of data unless the customer agrees and so on. So yeah, the, the next couple of years is going to be everything about trying to make peace between those two tribes. Not to mention that the biggest problem is uh, uh, the way Europe approaches the data privacy. It's like privacy first and security, national security second, while the US is the other way around, national security first and privacy the other way, privacy second. So yeah, that's two uh, main differences. But I also think that if I insult the prime minister right now on Facebook in some way, some fake account, uh, and if I said I'm going to kill him, I'm not. Please, no. But there's going to be police on my door in a couple of hours. No matter the U.S. services and so on, because it's something that's uh, against many, many laws. So the police will find a way to breach the data in order to get to me. So the, the, the main issue here is, as I said, between uh, U.S. and Europe. The other way, yeah. Marketers are, uh, they want uh, users, they want, but I usually say to people in, in um, Google Analytics world that uh, I prefer sessions. I like sessions because we behave the other way. We behave uh, one way when we are alone in some offline store. We behave the other way when we are with our partner in that store, with our kids when we are in that store. So every session is a difference. Yeah, I'm a buyer. I do have my lifetime value and so on. But even we, we uh, behave differently in the same situation and on the same website. That's why I love uh, sessions as a concept. But never mind. Users are still uh, a good concept. And Never mind the never mind the um, I don't know device ID or cookie ID or some technical data we share around. There are many many uh, people who still want to share I don't know email data or uh, names with Facebook. I think Alejandro uh, spoke about that as well. There are still customers who want to share the data with Facebook in order to get better uh, or better ads and so on. There's there was a lot of personal identifying information in Google Analytics for the past, I don't know, 10 years or so. Even Google, in Google Analytics, said some seven, eight years ago, if you find PII in, in your data, we'll delete the whole day of it. So there was a problem. But the problem is, what's a personal identifying data? I mean, if you, if you have a link on your website with uh, email address of your office, and if you uh, track that as an uh, event, which I usually do, there is an email address recorded in Google Analytics. Is it a PII or not? Not quite sure. If it's at office at mycompany.com, definitely not PII. If it's uh, Robert Petkovic at mycompany.com, is it a PII or not? It is a personal information. It's my personal information, but it's published on a website. It's not a personal information from a client who clicked on a, on a link. But sometimes even Google will say, no, 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 we need to erase that data. So there are many situations where machine learning, machine yeah. learning will delete the we data. Delete the data and so on. Yeah, but I, uh, there are many situations when you have a URL. I don't know if you fill the newsletter form and uh, the submit button goes into post mode or get, whatever, you have a URL of your email in in, uh, in web page, the thank you page. And of course, that URL is recorded in Google Analytics and that is a personal uh, data. So 
There are many, many cases in many implementation where we simply are not dealing with personal data the right way. So GDPR at least helped, or is, is trying to tell people, please be kind to your customers. Please be aware of their personal data. Don't spread it all around uh, and don't sell it. I 100% agree with that. I think um, it, it has been a great m motivator uh, to, to pick up some things that otherwise would not have been picked up. But I, I feel if we, if we stick to our side of it, right? So to the digital analytics part, and I think mostly for marketeers, right? So no, less for product analytics, mostly marketing analytics. I feel like we have been given user analytics and that concept came from more from the product analytics side because there it has been more about testing user flows and A-B testing and optimizing digital products. And of course, this gives us this interesting problem that all marketers like to ponder about, which is attribution, right? Uh, how, how to attribute across a, a customer journey with multiple sources. And um, well, you know, th th this, this problem can keep us up forever and we will never get a-, a, a Totally a different podcast, yeah, yeah, on attribution. But I can say that I, even Avin Oshkaushik yesterday said, okay, we're done with attribution. We don't know the attribution. Even he said that yesterday, yeah. I think it's really valuable to look at and to cons consider, but it is a, I don't think you will, there's no definitive answer, let's put it like that. But we got this technology, right? So we got this user analytics and our tools have gotten better and better and better over the last 10 years at least since since I've been working with it and, and you even longer. So you've seen a longer uh, track record of all the tools becoming better. But we also now, now we have the issue that we are a little bit, we are spoiled with what we have. And we also have this fear of losing what we have. Is that also what you recognize with your clients? That's actually what you said it's right. The fear of losing what we had is something that I recognize with my clients. Okay, I, I, I had that million uh, email addresses. What am I going to do now? Should I raise them all? I knew something about attribution. What am I going to do right now? I, I used to have a, a remarketing list of 2,000 people. Now I only have 50. What am I going to do now? Yeah, it is a losing. It is a fear of uh, losing something we already had or a fear of change. So... It, it is always like that. How do you how do you handle that at your clients? So how you 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 notice this fear, and then you, how how do you how how do you guide them? <laughs> always education, because uh, yeah, people are afraid of attribution. I would say afraid of attribution, but uh, the most afraid are those people who actually never had a strategy. They only looked for the last click attribution. They never had a strategy or one multi-touch multi attribution, and they are afraid that they will lose the attribution right now. And also, there's a great fear that I'm, what I'm seeing for the last two years since uh, Google Analytics 4 started, and to GF4, completely different podcast, the episode, yeah. Uh, but the, the issue with uh, the GA4 interface right now, people are afraid of Google Analytics 4 interface because it's something new. And they think they need they will need to find or they should find some valuable data in there, but they are not able to find it because it was so optimized. And um, uh, I, I relate to another story uh, from my life. Uh, uh, my my wife usually says when we go to some store, she said, "Yeah, I want that." She see a, a, a mannequin with uh, with some combination. She said, "Yeah, I like that." I don't want to go around the, the shelves and pick something because I'm not good at that. I like this. And this is also the situation in Google Analytics. We had 80 or 100 different reports and people were usually clicking around uh, Google Analytics for half an hour trying to find something which they will find interesting. Yeah, yeah, that, that's it. I, I find it now. So Google Analytics 4 came uh, along and said, okay, you have fewer reports, but you can make a lot more reports than in Google Analytics Universal right now. So you, I just need to know what you are looking for. And that's the main problem. You just need to know what you are looking for. Many marketers actually don't know what they are looking for. So I'm trying to educate them regarding GA4, regarding GDPR and their marketing strategy. 
that they need to know what they are looking for. They need to know what they are, what the strategy is before they are starting the digital marketing campaign, what they will achieve, what KPIs are, and so on. So by always, no matter what fear it is, it's a digital marketing, it's sport, it's real life, any fear can be lowered now with education and proper talk. So definitely education is the way to make them feel more comfortable and make them be more better marketeers. It's as I said, GDPR is good for marketing. It's not a problem that your marketing list actually it, it is, is smaller. Uh, there's much more quality data in that marketing list. And it that data can push you towards being a better marketeer. And of course, if you are just having small budgets or if you are, don't care, if you don't care about your uh, campaign and you just have some outsourcing agency who's spending tons of dollars on your uh, campaigns and you just want results, then yeah, you are in trouble. You you are actually not providing them with the appropriate data on your, or you don't have a strategy at all. Your strategy is let's give those guys uh, some money and they'll get some results. So in that in those cases, which is not that rare, it is a problem. I like what you just said. I think the one of the points you touched upon at the beginning really, um, really struck with me is that it is mainly the companies that have not yet actually used, like actually understand their data. So you use the, the, the example of attribution. So it's mainly the companies who only use last click and have never actually used complex attribution that are now afraid of losing it. And I think that makes a lot of sense. I, I recognize that as well. And I think that makes a lot of sense because they probably fear that all this data, they never actually got to really using it. So they fear they were already missing out and now it's going to be extracted away so they can never use it again, right? So for a lot of the more mature companies who already figured out how complex it is to work with data and how hard it is to like, and that you actually have to decide what data points you want to measure and make it work for you. It's not like this magic of the data will bring you the answer. It's more about you figure out what you want to measure and then you optimize against that. And that's, that is hard work. But the companies that realize that they are less afraid of GDPR because they understand that, hey, we will still have some data to work with and it will still be hard work to get value from it. Whereas the companies that do not realize that they see they had all this data that they rarely used or they only stared at reports, but they never really took action. And now the, the staring at reports becomes less interesting because there will be less data in it because of GDPR. So it feels like more loss, actually. Yeah, you you mentioned one word, digital maturity. It is actually a great concept. I, I don't look at companies as big, small, how, many re how much revenue they generate and so on. But I'm trying to figure out their level of digital maturity. Because then you you can you can create get great uh, projects. I remember when when people ask me, is there one factor you can uh, uh, where you can decide is this going to be a great project or not? <clears throat> and I usually say, in my experience, if the company has a digital marketer or some manager or coordinator between uh, outsourcing agencies and the internal team, then that's a good project. If there is a one person at the client side, not at company side, if there's one person who understands what each one of us should be doing and who understands our questions and is able to give proper answers because understands the business side, which we usually don't, that, that's the, the greatest factor that impacts the, the uh, success of some project. So definitely, if you have that, that's it. Digital maturity around the world is not that that good. There is also a story, if we have enough time, there is also a story how I uh, explain the digital maturity or what's a strategy in digital marketing. You know, uh, we, we are uh, Croatia. We are, let's say, pretty good in football or soccer, for the Americans say. We all, like any nation, we, we all, any nation thing is great in football. We think for the last hundred years or so, but yeah, we was, we were the second on, on the world championship. So yeah, we are kind of, kind of good. And, um, you know, we, we have, uh, we have Luka Modric, who is a great player, plays for Real Madrid. He doesn't score goals, 
But in nineteen, in two thousand and eighteen and two thousand nineteen, he uh, was voted on many occasions as the best uh, football player in the world. Why? He uh, uh, he's someone who can see uh, where the ball is coming, where the, the the goal scorer is, and he can pass the ball in great way, pretty much like uh, David Beckham used to do. He just passes ball like that. He's a touch point in the whole strategy. There is a goalkeeper, there is a, I don't know some defender player and so on. So any any uh, any action let's say starts for many action starts with the goalkeeper who passes to the, the ball to defender. He passes to Luka Modric. Luka Modric passes to I don't know uh, Ronaldo, and Ronaldo scores the goal. Who scored the goal? Ronaldo scored the goal. Each one of them is entitled to score. But what happens if we put a goalie in front? And if you put Ronaldo uh, as a goalkeeper, if you put Luka Modric as a defender, is that all going to be the same four different touch points, but with with different parts? And that action is not going to be as successful as one proper action. If you have a son, if you have a kid who is in, I don't know, kindergarten or, or elementary school, a lot of them are going to uh, soccer practices. And if you are looking at this, if, if, you, if you take a drone and put it above the, the, the field at soccer practice, what, what, you, what you're going to see? Everybody is running where the ball is. Everybody is running toward the ball. That's the average situation in digital marketing around the world. Everybody is running where the ball is. And once the kids are mature enough, like... 10 or 12 years of age, then they're like, okay, you will stay here, you will stay there, you will pass the ball to the... That's, I don't know, developing tactics and that's some strategy. Each football manager needs to deal with different uh, um, opponent in each game. That's our competition. Some of his players are injured. Some are not allowed to play. In each game, he needs to provide a different strategy. Yesterday, we beat Dan the Denmark in, in football because the, our manager completely switched the strategy in other half play, second half play. So he needs to provide the, uh, the good strategy, needs to know a lot of things around, and then he can look at the data uh, to see whether he was right or wrong. Not the other way. Many people are trying to look at the data. Okay, you need to see the data first to see, okay, some basics. But if you want to create a strategy, you need to know what to do, which kind of data you will get, what are KPIs, and then you will evaluate yourself and see where did you went wrong, what was right, and so on. To be able to change your strategy, meaning design, a copy, uh, functionalities, uh, audience, whatever, in your next uh, uh, campaign in order to get better results. Many, many people are just expecting that the machines will do that, that all by themselves, and we just need to throw them on. And yes, even Google and Facebook, they're using that uh, approach. And they said, just give us more money and we'll do the job and we'll get some results. The yeah. money gets thrown at them. That's why they, that's why they want that approach. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But yeah. I, I think I think what I really like, uh, I like this analogy. And if, the way I see it is a lot of companies think about it in, in a line. Like you look at the data and then you do stuff and then hopefully the stuff is better. But actually it is a circle, right? You have, and you have to continuously do it and learn each time. The good thing about digital technology is it helps us understand all those things much, much quicker, much better. You you need to, I don't know, change something, some copy and change some approach in your uh, campaign and you'll immediately get better results. It's great. Whenever I, I'm trying to, I, when I'm doing lectures, I'm telling kids, you're going to be a better version of yourself at the end of the day. At the end of each day, if you're just trying to look at the data and understand what you did, what is it, was it wrong or right? And you will understand your customers better if you just take a look at the data. It's it's small incremental step, but by the end of the month, you'll be, I don't know, 2% better than yourself at the, end of the, and the, the, at the beginning of the month. And being better than yourself is the hardest thing in the world. Being better than competition, that's maybe easy, but being better than yourself is something we should aim to. And uh, I said, digital uh, marketing enables us very, very well. That's why I'm thankful to be a part of, of such community. And the good thing about testing also is, uh, you know, when um, 
when you are on some meeting, there's always that so-called hippo effect, highest income paid person's opinion. So when we are stuck, we, we look at the person who we think it's mostly paid here, and uh, their decision will be the one which we will all vote for. Usually when I'm such at such meetings, I take each and every one suggestion and test it with the available tools we have. I test the data to see who was right, because maybe, okay, maybe Hippo was uh, right, and maybe he was right in most of cases, but that doesn't mean he'll be right in the next campaign, in the next, with the next product and so on. There's, we can test it and we can then go back with that data saying, look, this was something that we didn't think about it at all. This was something that made significant, significant impact on your product, on your revenue or whatever. And all the other things we thought is going to be better, like red button versus green button or so, doesn't mean a thing. Okay, red button, green button, mean a thing, but... We'll make it, a, we'll make it an orange button. An Amazon orange button, that works well, yeah. I, lo I love this, uh, this talk with you. I think... Um... I think if we if we if we tie it all back, I think the the core is education, right? If we if we if we if we want marketers and also digital analysts to embrace the change that we have to make in order to comply with GDPR, then the the main issue is actually education is not necessarily technology. Like we can configure the technology in however way we want, but we have to explain to people what needs to change and why it needs to change and why that's actually a good thing. Do you agree with that? Yeah, yeah. I, I'm thinking about all your previous guests. Guests, uh, uh, I know many of them, and we are all educators. No matter if we are talking about the, the law, the, the the technology, the, the JavaScript, or, or whatever, we are all trying to educate people who are involved in the whole process because we know, yeah, that education is the way to make things to make life go easier for all of us. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, we were we were talking about marketeers right now. Uh, we are not talking about uh, GTM server side or uh, Mark Schrems uh, second uh, whatever. But yeah, education always, always education is, is the way to go forward. And yeah, we spend us us educators we spend a lot of time uh, to learn something. Uh, to be able to translate that into some words that will help marketers save their time and money to learn the things they, they they know right now in order to make them work better. It's not it's not some I don't know it's not some devil coming from behind your screen regarding GDPR or something else. As I said, we need to be more polite to to people. That's what GDPR tells us, actually, and that's what we usually do in the real world. So it's not not a big deal. We should adopt that. So if people want to get educated by you, I do have my own website, uh, r o p e t k o ropetko dot com, with some educational materials. Most of them are in Croatian language because people in Croatia and surrounding countries love to talk, love to listen to me because um, I'm not speaking in English. And I'm not speaking about analytics and data in English, but in Croatian, so that they can understand me better. I do have my YouTube channel regarding uh, Google Analytics, also on Croatian. Maybe I'll put some subtitles. But there are also some uh, some uh, some material in English on my website. We'll provide the link. And uh, usually, I am at sub conferences uh, in a week or when this episode will be on air, I will already uh, attend a conference in Northern Macedonia, speaking about uh, analytics and GDPR. And also in November, yeah, in November, I'll be in Albania talking about GDPR and analytics. There is a, a lecture called uh, Google Analytics is legal and you should be fined. In parentheses, that's the title of my presentation. And also, uh, pretty soon I'll be in Croatia at the e-commerce Croatia conference. It's a commerce for uh, uh, web shop owners, where I'm also going to be speaking about the new GA4 and, and uh, GDPR and so on. I'm usually at conferences and some lectures you, you can find, even on Twitter, on, on LinkedIn, on, on Facebook. Yeah, I'm all around. Please do share uh, share your share your slides of this presentation on uh, on Twitter and LinkedIn. We would love to uh, love to look along with you. I might I might uh, like as a Christmas present or so. Yeah, yeah. 
Good. Thanks a lot for uh, sharing your knowledge and uh, hopefully we'll, uh, we'll talk soon again. Yeah. Thanks, Rick, for having me and hope to see you in person pretty soon.